So moving on to uh, Judge Douglas Ginsburg, uh, who is um, a judge at the United States Courts of uh, Appeal, um, and uh, he is uh, a well-known academician of uh, competition law. He has been with the Harvard Law School, as I have said, and he is now with the George Mason University, and he will be speaking about antitrust in high technology markets. You will note that we have designed the program of this year uh, quite revolving around new markets, if they are still considered to be new, uh, high-tech markets. As uh, you know, the uh, innovative markets are the true engine behind the growth of uh, societies. Economic growth is really induced through uh, innovative markets, so uh, we are really trying to focus on uh, innovative markets uh, this year. You will hear uh, Sham Kemani speaking about that. You will hear uh, Janiv Ar, who is uh, Microsoft's counsel uh, and uh, a professor at College of Europe, talk about that. You will hear Terra Loco of Google talk about this. And first, to uh, discuss uh, a, a similar matter, uh, we have uh, Judge Ginsburg. Uh, there are no overlaps in the issues that are uh, that are uh, discussed, so some people are talking more about hardware, some people are focusing on different aspects of things, and to keep it more interesting, uh, we have uh, a very uh, uh, lively debate right now happening in the world about uh, the uh, borders of enforcement that should be invited into uh, innovative markets. Are we doing too much? antitrust enforcement, should, be, should there be baby steps, or are we not doing enough, and are we allowing for, uh, for an abuse uh, that is going to be irreversible, as, um, as Ian uh, once said in one of the hearings that we were together, uh, a bell that is rung cannot be unrung, uh, in Ian's terminology. Uh, that's uh, a, a, an evil and a blessing, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and uh, the innovative markets are really inviting that question and that debate in competition law. So without further ado, uh, uh, Judge Ginsburg, please. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to begin briefly by thanking our, our mutual hosts, uh, 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 the uh, Elie Law Firm and uh, Mr. Gerkayan, for bringing us here. This is my third visit to um, Turkey and to, uh, to uh, Istanbul and other parts of the country this year, and I hope it's not my last. We'll find out in a moment. Um, in the U.S., um, when people play uh, pinball, a game that I think is people remember here, pinball machines shooting little balls, um, it's often said that um, uh, the prize is that if you win, you get to play again. Uh, obviously, uh, Fred Cheney, who was here last year, uh, one and is uh, back with us again. Um, so uh, that said, I'm, I'm going to, as, uh, as you just heard, I'm going to speak about um, antitrust and high-tech markets. Um, and I'm going to begin uh, where I think this subject began, which is to say in 2000, uh, when the federal trial court in uh, Washington, D.C. issued its uh, conclusions of law in the uh, case of the United States against Microsoft. And as many of you know, um, at that uh, time, the court held that uh, Microsoft had violated the Sherman Act, um, in particular by attempting to monopolize uh, the web browser market, uh, and by monopolizing the market for operating systems, and by trying, uh, uh, tying its web browser to its operating system. Now, those conclusions would shortly be um, reviewed uh, by my court, and we would uphold some of the conclusions and reverse others and send the matter back to the trial court for uh, further proceedings, and, uh, at, at which point the case was settled. But even before the Microsoft case could um, reach its way to the Court of Appeals, public figures were um, already thinking about whether and how to adapt uh, antitrust laws to, uh, to new markets. And a good example comes from uh, Larry Summers, who, uh, a distinguished economist, former president of Harvard University, who was then Secretary of the Treasury. Um, and he made this observation on the difference between 
um, the old economy, as we'll call it, and the uh, emerging new economy. Quote, the industrial economy was a Newtonian system of checks and balances in which disequilibria of demand and supply arose only to be equilibrated by adjusting prices. The right metaphors for the new economy are more Darwinian with the fittest surviving, the, frequent, uh, the winner frequently taking all, close quote. Now I've often, uh, since then, uh, uh, since grappling with the Microsoft uh, case, thought about the challenge of taking a competition law regime and policy that was developed for the old industrial economy and markets and adapting it to these new high-tech markets with which we're all now somewhat familiar. For the last 35 years, uh, competition policy in the U.S. and increasingly around the world has focused on price and output. And indeed, the central goal of modern uh, merger policy has been to prevent a firm from acquiring market power uh, sufficient to implement a small but significant um, increase in price. But price and, and, and quantity are, are metrics, metrics of static efficiency. Um, that is the, the most productive use of uh, resources at any particular moment in time. Dynamic efficiency, that is investing resources so as to maximize productivity over time, is what we really want. Gains in wealth are mostly due to innovation, not to marginally improving the efficiency of what, are, what we already have. Uh, Robert Salo, a solo received the Nobel Prize in 1987 for this very theorem. But dynamic efficiency is uh, much more difficult to, to measure. How can one know whether uh, investment uh, is a, in a particular market is at um, an appropriate level? But in the new economy, the regular rise and fall of, of high-tech giants seems to indicate that competition to market new ideas is uh, is quite fierce. So let me um, give you a first of uh, these examples. I'm not sure exactly where to point this thing. There we go. Um, let's look at uh, social media first. Uh, in 2005, a uh, news corporation purchased uh, MySpace for 580 million US dollars. In 2011, it sold MySpace for 35 million dollars. That was 6% of what it had paid just those few years before, five years. The rapid decline of MySpace was due to Facebook, which went public in 2010 with a, uh, a valuation of 104 billion US dollars. But today, less than six years later, as impressive as this chart shows you, uh, even Facebook does not completely own the social media market. The market for social media continues to grow and to fragment as other services, such as Google Plus and Twitter and many others, have gained footholds. Some, such as LinkedIn, to which my guess is many people here uh, 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 subscribe, uh, have, some have a more specialized appeal. LinkedIn, of course, being for professionals' connections, and have come to dominate that segment of the market and online dating is another example. Tinder has steadily gained a market share against what had been dominant just a few years ago, eHarmony. But it seemed that what Tinder did was actually to redefine the market by creating a service for fast, casual dating by targeting young people who are not otherwise interested in traditional, short tradition, but nonetheless traditional online dating with its comprehensive user profiles uh, and its emphasis on serious relationships. And not surprisingly, as in any efficient market, new entrants to, in Tinder's drive-by model of dating uh, online quickly emerged. So in each case, we see competition to some, within the market, but there's something else going on too. Um, Facebook did not destroy MySpace through a series of uh, successive marginal improvements in quality. Facebook fundamentally changed the way that more than now more than one and a half billion people uh, communicate and network with each other. And in doing so, 
it emerged victorious in the competition for the market. Facebook, in other words, became the successive monopolist to MySpace. Then other com companies broadened the social media market and grabbed pieces of it. High-tech companies that dominate a market may, or at least may seem to, gain market power to the detriment of competition and that, therefore, to consumers. But the ability to price as a monopolist, for a time at least, is not necessarily anti-competitive. As the Supreme Court, I think, astutely observed a dozen years ago in the Trinco case, the Supreme Court of the United States, quote, the opportunity to charge monopoly prices, at least for a short time, is what attracts business acumen in the first place. It induces risk-taking that produces innovation and economic growth." Close quote. Now, it seems to me quite plausible that competition for the field, and therefore success of monopolies, may be a benign new normal in a non-trivial segment of the digital marketplace. And I say benign because, as the British economist Sidgwick uh, wrote in 1859, so long as there is competition for the field, even if there's a monopoly within the field, competitive conditions will prevail. The incumbent monopolist, that is, will be constrained by the threat of new entry. If the barriers to entering the market are low, as they are in many, but admittedly not in all, internet-based markets. Competition agencies around the world are still working to adapt enforcement strategies from uh, traditional industries to the new economy. And today I'm going to discuss some notable features exhibited by high-tech companies and offer some thoughts on how these characteristics should affect the way competition agencies approach new markets. Well, what makes these markets different? In the high-tech sector, to some degree as elsewhere, companies comp compete to create the most attractive, I mean, of course, as elsewhere, to compete, uh, create the most attractive product. But in high-tech industries, uh, they're often characterized by a greater prevalence of certain market dynamics first of which uh, is network effects, by which uh, I refer to the increased utility that the user of, of a product derives from each additional user of the same product. The classic example is the telephone. That's indeed the telephone network. When uh, Bell invented the telephone, he did not have anybody to call. Thereafter, each new subscriber joining the network not only got the benefit of being able to call the others, he also gave the others the benefit of being able to call him. Hence, one network emerged as the successful monopolist. So network effects have been around for a long time, but they're especially prevalent in um, internet services. Instant messaging, social media, uh, dating services, and so on are only as useful to an individual as the number of, of other users, um, uh, 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 whatever the other, other number of other users may be. Even platforms like Amazon, which sells conventional goods and services, uh, m may rely on and benefit from network effects. Because the more vendors that sell through Amazon, the more likely customers are to use Amazon for their online shopping, which makes Am Amazon more valuable to the vendors. Now, not all network effects are utility enhancing. Product differentiation may actually counteract uh, network effects in some cases, and we'll consider again as an example dating services. Tinder may have millions of users, but for a farmer who is interested only in being matched with another farmer, um, additional non-farmers uh, joining the website not only fail to increase his uh, utility, they may actually uh, decrease uh, by raising his search costs because he now has to look through a larger number of people who are not really relevant. Still, network effects probably explain 
at least in part, why the valuations of tech companies often depend uh, more on a demonstrated ability to attract users than a demonstrated ability to generate revenue and profits. In network-heavy industries, investors assume companies eventually will figure out how to monetize their service. But without, the critical, without a critical mass of users, there is no business. Now, this is something that a few companies are discovering right now. Um, from a competition standpoint, agencies should be keeping in mind the potential for network effects to act as a barrier to entry. Traditional barriers to entry, such as capital costs and regulations, are low in the market for online services. The potential entry of new comp competitors deters uh, even dominant incumbents from exercising market power, as we saw with uh, Sidgwick's uh, observation from 1859. If the market exhibits powerful um, network effects, however, a potential competitor would need not only to develop a co competitive product, but also to convince millions of people to adopt it. And that could take years, and the cost and time horizon can significantly weaken the competitive constraint that are posed by uh, potential entrants. Second, beyond network effects, uh, digital markets sometimes exhibit enormous, unprecedented economies of scale. Microsoft, <coughs> pardon me, spent billions of dollars developing Windows 10, but the cost to sell each license each additional license is very close to zero. The company does not even need to burn and ship a CD-ROM anymore. Users can download the installation directly from the Microsoft website. So the market for search is similar. As has been pointed out, Google's cost of developing its search algorithms are largely unaffected by whether uh, it does three and a half billion searches or one billion searches per day. Now, some might wonder whether such high fixed costs and low marginal costs make a dominant firm in, in one of these markets, such as Google and Search, a natural monopoly, so-called natural monopoly. Well, we should be very wary of uh, conventional terminology and conventional remedies, because in the case of a natural monopoly, that's typically rate regulation, uh, to, in order to, uh, to constrain what seems to be a monopoly, at least for a time, on the web, um, because this could have disastrous effects for both uh, competition and consumers. Competition agencies should also be cognizant, however, that significant economies of scale may make new entry with, uh, into certain markets unlikely or even uh, impossible for all but a firm with access to a great deal of capital, and as example being Google. Uh, in search, for example, Microsoft is estimated to have lost, to have lost about $11 billion on its Bing search engine between its launch in 2010 and the end of 2013. And in fact, it was only in the first quarter of fiscal 2016 that Bing, the search engine, finally turned a profit. Entry by yet another company seems um, unlikely, if not uh, impossible with the scale of investment uh, being that large, certainly too large for venture capital. So in markets like search then, that means that recoupment looks of the investment looks more plausible should a dominant firm manage to force its rivals, um, to rivals out. So our concern with predatory and exclusionary conduct should be greater than it is in industrial markets. Third, multi-sidedness. At the same time, the market structures that prevail in some high-tech markets should cause competition agencies to rethink exactly what types of conduct should be deemed predatory. The key features of a multi-sided platform are two or more groups of customers who need each other, but who cannot capture the value of their mutual attraction on their own and therefore they rely on the platform to facilitate value-creating interactions between them. For the platform, which needs both groups of, of customers, profit maximization may involve charging below marginal cost to get one group uh, to participate, 
uh, for example, by giving free access or even a subsidy, such as uh, loyalty points. This was, of course, the very uh, seemingly traditional market, uh, market model for, uh, say, broadcast radio and television. Uh, right there, the, there was no possibility for the broadcasters and the viewers or listeners to transact. This is before cable and satellite came along. Uh, and so, in fact, the programming was given free to consumers, and the charge was levied um, on advertisers. And that's become a the familiar structure for many uh, online services. So a, co a, a competition agency that's um, reviewing a merger or uh, investigating uh, uh, unilateral conduct in a uh, two-sided market has to consider both groups of customers. Uh, a free service or a service with a negative price uh, because it pays consumers to, to use the service. Uh, Bing, I understand, gives loyalty points to users. Now, that might look predatory under traditional antitrust analysis because of the below-cost pricing. But in most cases, the service is not actually being sold below cost. It's just that the consumer is not the one who's paying for the cost. Seems that type one errors in um, antitrust enforcement, that is errors that uh, wrongfully condemn pro-competitive pro conduct, are more likely to occur when a firm, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> Uh, when a firm with a multi-sided structure competes against firms with a more traditional structure. For example, selling books online as opposed to selling books in a bookstore. <clears throat> as the, uh, the Apple eBooks um, investigation revealed, Amazon uh, often sold eBooks below the cost of the book. But as you browse Amazon's website, the company is earning advertising revenue from your online presence. Because you are looking at their website, they are being paid by the advertisers on that site. And that came to about a billion dollars last year for Amazon. Amazon's practice of below cost uh, prices with advertising revenue greatly disadvantages traditional bookstores, as we all have seen. But that does not mean that it's anti-competitive. Consumers are almost certainly better off, and certainly that's true as Internet uh, access approaches ubiquity. And concern for competitors, for the bookstores, for instance, in that example, um, is misplaced as a matter of competition policy. The loss of bookstores is merely the price of dynamic efficiency, what Schumpeter um, called creative destruction which is the source of most gains in consumer welfare, as Solo uh, proved. Next, multi-homing. Uh, multi-homing refers to consumers using multiple services to solve the same problem. And again, this is not unique to tech, uh, but is more prevalent. A subscriber to the Financial Times might also subscribe to the Wall Street Journal, um, and to The Economist to make sure that uh, he or she gets all of the relevant, uh, important business news. But digital technology makes this phenomenon easier and more common. If I run a search on Google and don't find what I'm looking for, with a few keystrokes, I can run the same search on Bing or on Arable. And had I not been fortunate enough to, uh, to meet my, my lovely wife, I might have simultaneously posted dating profiles on Match.com and eHarmony and other sites in order to maximize uh, my opportunities, my choices. So multi-homing may preserve competition indefinitely because consumers do not need to abandon uh, one service in order to gain access to another. Competition agencies should be keenly aware of this dynamic because where multi-homing is is um, common, the risk of foreclosure is very small. Um, next, and this is, I may have uh, deprived you of a slide earlier on. Um, this was the two brief, and Ch uh, Judge uh, Frégenie was going to elaborate on two-sided markets. I don't want to uh, impinge on his point too much. Um, this next feature is um, the, the about multi-featured uh, platforms and ecosystems. 
Competition between rival ecosystems is another new phenomenon, and it's one of almost unknown in the old economy. A single company may now market a proprietary operating system, sell, compete, uh, compete along with others, competing devices that work on that system, and operate online stores that sell applications or apps that work on the devices. If you walk into an Apple store, a salesperson will be glad to set you up with a new iPhone, which runs on Apple's uh, iOS, saves your pictures to Apple's iCloud, streams your videos through your TV using Apple TV, browses the web through Apple's Safari, and pays for groceries using Apple Pay. Meanwhile, next door, you can buy a Nexus phone made by Google, running Google's Android operating system, which saves your pic pictures to Google Drive, streams your videos through your TV using Google, Google Chromecast, browses the web through Google's Chrome, and lets you pay for your groceries using Google Wallet. In theory, iCloud competes with Google Drive, Chromecast competes with Apple TV, and the Safari browser competes with Chrome. In reality, though, those are not the significant dimensions of competition. Each is merely a feature, part of a much larger competition between two comprehensive ecosystems. At this point, Apple's iPhone has 43% of the smartphone market in the US and 20% in Europe. More smartphone users are running the Android operating system, 52% in the US and 71% in Europe, on devices made by a number of different companies, including Samsung, LG, Motorola, HTC, and Google itself. From a competition standpoint, one can see how the uh, transition from one ecosystem to another might raise or be thought to look like a barrier to entry because a lot of programs and features are symbiotic with other programs and features, a new entrant may need to launch and support multiple products and services simultaneously. That is to say, on, in order to enter, much as a, a new entrant in the old economy might have, have to enter at two levels in the chain of distribution in order to compete with incumbents who operate at both levels. Microsoft's mediocre results launching its own ecosystem illustrate this phenomenon. So we've dealt with the Apple and the Google ecosystems. Microsoft's uh, got only 3% of US smartphone users uh, with a Windows phone, which runs the Microsoft mobile operating system. And this meager um, showing is probably attributable largely to the relative paucity of applications available for that system. In fact, Windows Phone Store has just 100,000 apps on offer. It may seem like a lot, but compare that to 1 million available for Android and for Apple's iOS devices. Many of the most popular apps are unavailable um, on Windows phones because they're owned by Google, for example, being YouTube. Understandably, Google might not want to make Windows phones more attractive by making key features, such as YouTube, available to Microsoft. This does not necessarily mean that competition agencies should insert themselves into this limited rivalry. Just as Google has valuable properties that Microsoft may want, such as YouTube, Microsoft has properties that Google may want. Each company has an incentive to develop new capabilities that make its ecosystem superior to the other. This competition results in, as we see almost daily, continuous innovation with benefits to consumers. All right, so what are the implications of all this for enforcement? There's more concern in Europe uh, than in the US that monopoly power in high-tech markets will persist uh, long enough to raise competition concerns. This is a real possibility. There's just more concern about it in some places than in others. So I, I ask you to contrast this observation by um, Alexander Italiana, who until just a few months ago was Director General of um, DG Comp, the European Commission, 
with what I quoted earlier uh, from the Supreme Court's Trinko decision about um, m monopoly profits, at least for a time, being the fact, the uh, goal that drives innovation and competition and attracts investment. Italianer said, history tells us that competition for the market, as exemplified by disruptive innovations that introduce totally new business models in high-tech markets, may happen slower than predicted. Close quote. And of course, that's right. It may happen that way. Americans greater faith in the likely speed of innovation, particularly in high-tech sectors, is illustrated uh, more concretely in the different approaches that the U.S. and the European Commission took uh, with regard to the um, merger in 2010 uh, between Intel and McAfee. Uh, the U.S. approach was very simple. Uh, Intel makes microchips. Uh, McAfee makes uh, security software uh, because the companies do not compete. The U.S. cleared the merger without an investigation. The EU approach was different. And I'm going to quote, this is uh, the commission, because Intel could have leveraged its strong market power in the x86 processor market to degrade the interoperability of products with the security solutions of rival vendors, close quote, the commission required a commitment that Intel would not do that. So quite a let's say, more, um, more concern about uh, uh, possible um, exclusionary conduct uh, in the EU approach uh, than in the U.S. approach. Uh, we also saw uh, the Americans' greater faith in innovation lead to different outcomes in the U.S. and European investigations into allegations by downstream competitors that Google's uh, search results are biased in favor of its own services. Uh, last April, the European Commission issued a statement of objections against Google, uh, with Commissioner Vestager, Vestager saying um, she is, quote, concerned that the company has given an unfair advantage to its own comparison shopping service in breach of EU antitrust rules, close quote. Now, previously, the Commission had um, obtained commitments uh, that require Google to show competitors' uh, links more prominently. Uh, for example, to show uh, MapQuest alongside of Google Maps uh, or Travelocity alongside of Google Flights. The Commission had preliminarily concluded that giving priority to Google's own services uh, in the search results uh, was a possible violation of the EU uh, antitrust rules prohibiting the abuse of a dominant position. And they did that in part because users, they said, were not aware of Google's uh, self-promotion and because competitor search services were more difficult for users to find. Meanwhile, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission had closed its investigation of the very same conduct in 2013, saying that although Google took, quote, aggressive actions to gain advantage, close quote, over, that is, over rival specialized uh, search services like flights or uh, uh, travel and so on, uh, and including the shopping comparison services that were at issue in the European Commission's case, case uh, the, the FTC said, the, uh, our mission is to protect competition, not individual competitors, and close the investigation. Now, all that said, even in the EU, regulators have not failed to notice the rapid evolution uh, of online markets. In the um, Internet Explorer decision in 2009, the European Commission concluded that individuals' ability to download consumer-facing applications, in that case it was web browsers, uh, was an ineffective alternative to pre-installation by the original equipment manufacturer. The decision prohibited Microsoft from uh, interfering with decisions of um, computer manufacturers to install only uh, non-Microsoft web browsers, uh, as well as its commitment to distribute through Windows Update a browser choice screen that presents users with a menu of browser options and lets them choose one or more. Two years later, only two years later, however, in Microsoft Skype, the merger, um, in that investigation, the European Commission found that downloading of consumer-facing applications, in that case it was communications apps, was so easy that consumers were using concurrently more than one communication service, such as Google Talk, Apple FaceTime, and Skype. 
and in, finally in approving Facebook's acquisition of WhatsApp in 2014, the European Commission emphasized the fast-moving nature of the consumer communication sector driven by, how barrier, by low barriers to entry, ease of downloading, and the prevalence of multi-homing. In other words, DG Comp has, never, uh, has been um, quite attuned to changes in the digital marketplace and has adjusted its enforcement policy uh, accordingly. Although the U.S. and the uh, Commission, the EU, uh, have reached, uh, uh, EC, have reached different uh, decisions with regard to particular practices and transactions, there's general agreement that in the high-tech industries, the focus of the antitrust laws must be to ensure that incumbent companies do not stifle innovation and the rapid gains in dynamic efficiency that have defined the sector until now. That's a very different emphasis than uh, was true in uh, the old economy. So in sum, we are seeing the emergence of new kinds of markets that bear a little resemblance to uh, most markets that shaped modern antitrust doctrine. Uh, some of the distinguishing features of those markets demand continuing uh, competition scrutiny, but others caution greater restraint by the enforcement agencies. In industries in which the primary means of competition is innovation, antitrust agencies must adapt their analyses of competitive effects to the realities of how high-tech market func markets function, or they will risk making enforcement decisions that penalize competition rather and consumers rather than help them. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>